Hello everyone. So I wanted to make a quick tutorial and to show you step by step how to create a 3D model from photos. I realized that maybe in the presentation we went over it a little bit uh, too quickly. And I want to take this opportunity to make a five minute tutorial and show you some extra steps so that you can make your model precise and to scale. Okay. So in this case, I'm using Metashape, as I mentioned during the tutorial, the other application that you can use is Reality Capture. But for this purpose, I'll, st I'll stick to Metashape and you can also download a free version, a trial version for 30 days, uh, just enough so that you can go through your project, okay? And so the way it works is that uh, the most important thing that we're going to be working with uh, for the majority of this tutorial is here, the workspace and what we call a chunk, okay? So what we're going to do, you're gonna put all your photos in one folder and I'll just right click and say, add a folder, okay? And now this would bring me to, to my folder. And so let's say this in this photogrammetry folder, I have all of them. So I'll just hit select folder and it would say, hey, I recognize 38 images in this particular case. Are those single cameras or is this a dynamic scene? Every time when you take regular photos, we consider that every one of them, it's a single camera. So I'll just leave it as it is and I'll say, okay. And as you can see, on my photos tab, all the images appeared. Now, usually in this case, I have 38 images, but if I have a lot more of them, one of the things that I like to do is to run a quality check. So the software would automatically detect if the photos are good or bad, and I'll be able to disable the bad ones. So if I select the first one, and if I hit right click and say, estimate image quality, I'll hit this and I'll say all cameras. I'll hit okay, it's going to take maybe a minute or even less than that. Okay, and we're done. So now what I need to do is I just need to make sure that I show the details. And as you can see right here, I have the quality. So if I hit to sort it by quality, you will see that some images are with a better quality. So the value as it goes close to one, that means it's a good quality. And if it's lower than this, that means it's a bad quality. So let's say here I have an image at 0 0.5 and I'll just double click on it and probably it gave me that it's 0 0.5 because it looks a little bit blurry, so it's understandable. Um, however, I would judge that it's actually not that bad. It could have been worse. So actually, let's say this one is really bad. So because I don't like this one, I can just right click on it and I say disable camera. That means that this image will not be used for the computation of the 3D model. So if your images look good, you've done your triage, the ones you like and the ones you don't like. And I'm just going to pull this to the side. We're going to talk about it in a second. So the next step I'm going to do is right click on my chunk and I will say process align photos. Again, depending on how big your project is, how many images you have and what kind of machine you're using, you can change your settings. In this particular case, I will just stick to high, but just because I'm working on a machine that's made for this kind of thing. So, but you can leave it at medium. It doesn't matter. Let me just kind of tell you what we're looking at here. When we talk about key uh, point limit, that means that Metashape is going to look at every single photo and it will judge at least 40,000 points in each individual image that it thinks that are good points that it can follow across several images. And so it will create these 40,000 points per image, but we're telling it that it can use only 4,000 as it goes between photos, meaning that out of these 40,000 points per image, when it's comparing two images, it's going to look for the 4,000 best ones in order to create our stitching. And I would say that this number for me uh, has always worked perfectly fine. So I'll just leave it as it is and I'll hit okay and I'll get back to you in a minute. Okay, that means we are ready. So if I go here on the tab, I can just close this image. And if I go to model you, and if I double click anywhere, this will become my point of rotation. So you can see that we have a, what we call a loose point cloud. And this is made up out of these 4,000 points per image, which it found that it's enough information to stitch them together. Okay. And then now the next thing we can do is we can actually check with the markers, how precise the image is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open any photo. So let's say this one is a, it's, it's perfect because I see all the markers inside. 
And the other things that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to view and I will open this window reference. So I already have it open and it would look something like this. We have all your images and then here we will create our markers. So creating a marker is actually super easy. I will zoom in on this image right at the intersection, right click, add a marker, is going to call it point one, and you see that it would appear here at the bottom. And I will do this for all of them. I would say this, add a marker, so this will become point two, point three, point four, five and six, of course. Oh, no, there's no six. So, okay, so one, two, three, four, four, five. And as you can see right now, because we actually don't have a scale yet, it's just telling me that the accuracy is down to 0 0.005 meters, which for MetaShape right now means absolutely nothing. And so one thing we want to make sure is that now that we have placed this marker at the intersection, we want to make sure that across all the photos, it actually hits that intersection. So what I'm going to do here, just to make my life a little bit easier, I'm going to hit right click on point one and I will say filter photos by marker. So what you see here is that on the right hand side, oh, okay, I can keep it there, that doesn't matter. That on the right hand side, I have all my images, but it aligned them or at least sorted them uh, with the most reliable uh, position of the marker. So if I zoom in, let's say on the first one, when it, the flag is green, that means that you have put the marker in place and you've told the software, yes, this is the right position. When the flag is blue, it means that it is certain that it's putting it at the right place. And that means that for the calculation at the end, when you're creating your dense point cloud and your mesh, it will be using that point. Now, this is good enough for me. So, you know, I'll just continue to the next image. Now you have two options here. You either select the next image and you say, you know, this is maybe not at the right place. So I just drag and drop it at the right spot. Or you can use the page up and down on your keyboard to go through the photos. So if I go to the next one, this is fine. This is fine. This is almost fine. And I'll just kind of go through them very quickly. And I'm actually happy with the results and what is showing me. See when your flag is white here, that means that it's not sure and it doesn't want to assume which is okay, I'll just grab the point and place it at the right spot. See here it's absolutely off, so grab it and bring it to the right spot. Here it's okay, it's okay, oh, this is absolutely not okay, and so on and so on. Now, you would do this for every single photo, or maybe not necessarily every single photo, at least um, a good portion of them. Oh, you see how this one snapped into place by itself? Because you've been telling it where the point is, and now it's actually learning from uh, itself. That means that in here, I can go and say, right click on point two, filter points by marker. That means that now, if I hit the first one, is the one which I assigned to it, because it's the most certain one, and then is the next one, and so on and so on. And I'm just hitting the page down on my keyboard until I see something that is completely off. So these ones actually look pretty good. I have no complaint here. Oh, here it can be a little bit better centered. Let me keep going. See, let's say here it is very off. So I'm going to put it back in its place. Next. And as I said, you don't have to do uh, the same thing for all of them. Now, one thing to, to simply keep in mind is that if you see a point like this where you don't directly see your marker, you should not place it because then it would become confused and it would think that this part on the award in this particular case is the actual point when it's not. So just ignore it, let it see through it. That's perfectly fine. And so I'm happy with the results. Let me just, let's say, do the same thing for point three. And this is the part of the video where feel free to just kind of skip ahead because I'm just doing the same operation over and over again, but this is not at the right place. This is absolutely not at the right place. This is not at the right place. This is okay ish. And so keep in mind, I'm just using page up and page down on my keyboard to um, cycle through the photos. And I'll just do this for all of the points so that at least I have more than one, um, kind of completely 100% uh, 
uh, short point per marker. So let's see if I hit four, I'm okay with this. Okay, this is good. This is not good. Now it's good. Okay, and I'll just do the same thing for five. Oh, right click, filter. And by the way, if I show, let's say medium sized, you can actually see what the flag is. So let's say here, the, the blue ones, it's pretty sure as to where it is. I'm kind of happy with it. I'll just go to the white flags because that means that there it's not sure at all. And it can take some attention or additional care. This makes sense. This is fine. And, and you see that as I was placing these points, some of the white flags became blue because now it learned and said, aha, uh -huh, okay. Now I know exactly what where you want me to place this tag. Okay, fantastic. Now, the next thing you would notice here in this reference tab is that we also have an error uh, tab, which means, and by the way, it also measures it in meters and in pixels. In this particular case, I will ignore the meters one just because there's no scale to the image or at least there is not one yet. But that means that in general, it is on average for let's say marker number five, two and a half pixels off, which is actually pretty good or three or let's say almost four pixels. But we're actually going to make this a lot tighter, close to zero, because this is what we want. And the way we're going to do this is by going to, my, to our chunk, right click on it, process again, and this time instead of aligned photos, you will say optimize cameras. When you hit the optimize cameras, you will just hit the additional fit points here. There's no need for us to go over them right now. Just select them, click OK, and wait literally a few seconds. And you can see how now the error here has become a little bit tighter. It's not the best, but hey, let's run it one more time. And this time I would say adapt adaptive camera modeling. Okay, it didn't change that much, but that means that overall we're actually looking pretty good. This means that now we are ready for our next step, which is to give it a scale, okay? So let's assume for a moment, and I'm just going to remove my filter here. Let's assume for a moment that we knew what is the exact distance between point 0.3 and point 0.5. And let's assume for a moment that that is exactly half a meter, okay? So what I'm going to create now is a line between point 0.3 and point 0.5, and I will force Metashape to accept that it's exactly half a meter. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to select here point 0.3, hold control, point 0.5, right click, and I would say create the scale bar right here in the second option. Click and you would see this line being created right here, right here as a scale bar. And I'll simply double click where it says distance and I would say 0 0.5 meters. And it will tell me that we were off by four meters. That's fine. Because now, again, we're going to run the optimized cameras one more time. So right click on the chunk, process, optimize cameras, yes. And you see that now this came to zero. That means that this model has been scaled so that the distance from three to five or three to five actually corresponds to this. And if I go to our model, we should be able to see the line. There it is. So this is the line and this line right now is exactly half a meter. So that means that now we have an accurate representation. We're hitting all our markers. We are to scale at this point which means that from here, we can actually proceed towards creating the dense point cloud. So right click, process, build dense cloud. Uh, depending on the version you have, if you have the newest version 2.0 and above, instead of dense uh, point cloud, it would just say build point cloud, which is fine. Dense point cloud, I will just use the same settings medium. That's perfectly fine by me. And I'll just say, okay. And it will probably take about two minutes. Okay, so the processing is done, which means that now we can take a look at the dense point cloud, or again, if you have the new version, just the point cloud, you are going to click up here, click. And now we have, so by the way, if I just double click somewhere, this becomes my point of rotation. So now we have a much more interesting detailed version of the point cloud. Keep in mind, this is still a point cloud. Now, one thing you might notice is that some points look good, like the surface here. Some points look pretty bad, like everything here, and maybe some pieces of this award, simply because I don't have a lot of photos. 
let's say this was an original set of 200, but we just used 38 just to make everything a little bit more faster. So there's actually a way for me to filter this. If you go up here where you have your dense point cloud and you look at dense cloud confidence, it would show you a scale as to which points it is sure are good and which points are not. So you can see that points that are pretty far away or points where there's no information in the surface just because it's a white table, it's not sure. This is why they're in red. So the confidence is one and everything that is very sure of like this surface here is 100 because it's um, there's a lot of detail that it can grasp on. You can also see that inside the award is in red just because it was dark and there's no information there. And we can actually delete only the points with low confidence. And the way we do this, we go to tools, dense cloud or point cloud, depending on the version, filter by confidence. And for some reason here, the scale is from one to 100. Here it gives you from zero to 255. It doesn't matter. I want it from zero to one. Okay. And you see that I'm left with only the really, really bad points. So I'm just going to hide my marker so that I don't delete them. I'll go over the selection tool. I'll make a selection and simply hit the delete button. And from there, tools, dense point cloud and reset filter, yes. And now we're left with data that is a little bit more acceptable. And if I go to my dense cloud, you see that these bad points are gone. If you want to keep removing points, which is completely normal, you can either use the rectangle tool or the free form select. So I can just select a bunch of points, delete them and we're good to go. So now we have the dense point cloud. At this point, you can actually stop and export and bring it into Revit. And the way you would do this is right click on the chunk, export points. You will choose where you want them to be exported. You will give them a name. So let's say in this particular case, I would say export points as E57. And one thing you just wanna make sure you do is that you don't want to export in global coordinate systems. Uh, this is usually reserved for drones. So what you're going to do is you're going to export it in local meters. Okay. Click hit. Okay. is going to export it. And from that point on, you just need to run it through recap so that it becomes a format that Revit can read. However, the same format E57 can be read by other softwares like Rhino if we're using it. So I'm just going to hit cancel here. Next step. We want to create a mesh because we want to make an object that is easy to render. So right click on the chunks process. We've been here before, build a mesh. And in this particular case, the quality medium is fine by me because I'm not using this particular object to remodel it or anything. I'm just using it for it to be pretty somewhere in a rendering scene. So quality, I'm good with medium. And for the face count, I would hit high. That's perfectly fine by me and say, okay. So it's going to take a minute and let's see what comes out of it. All right, so now that it's done, we need to switch our view to show us the mesh, which is up here. Click and you would see our mesh. As you can see, it's not super detailed uh, in the texture of the concrete. Few reasons for this. Our initial analysis was not as the highest quality. And also when we were creating the mesh, we didn't say that we wanted the highest precision. So this is okay. I mean, this is expected in a sense. If I go to mesh shaded, it's just going to show me the color of every triangle that it created. And as you can see, we don't have enough detail because we haven't created the texture yet. And we'll be using the texture uh, as an element to render and this will give us plenty of detail. So that means the next step, as you can guess, chunk, right click process build texture because this is a small object and I won't be rendering from up close. Let's say one texture of 4k resolution is perfectly fine for me. I want the texture to be a diffuse map because uh, occlusion map will just give you the areas that are dark versus bright and we don't need this diffuse is synonymous with color. So I'll just leave it as it is click. Okay. And we are done. So now in order for us to see the texture, we will just go in the drop down menu and say model textured click. And there you go. Now we have our model. We can cut it simply by selecting the faces again with the select tool and delete. 
but that's it. Now we have our object and honestly it looks great. Even though the mesh itself didn't have all the detail, the texture can cover for us. One way to improve the quality of the texture as well is when you take the photos, make sure that you don't take them too fast in the sense that if you're taking them with a phone, just hold it for a second, make sure the photo is taken well and it's not blurry, move on to the next one and so on and so on. So that means that from this point on, for you, the only step that's left is to export that model. And the way we're going to do this is right click on the chunk, export, and we'll say export model. Now, keep in mind that when you export, so I'm just going to call it export two in my particular case, I would recommend to you to use the FBX format. And the reason for it is because it keeps the scale and the real world size of the object. So we've already given it half a meter between 0.3 and 0.5. So at the FBX format is going to uh, preserve it for you. Click save. And we have a bunch of uh, options. Again, we want to, we want to make sure that we keep this in local coordinates in meters. So this is fine. We want to, uh, export the texture as well in JPEG. You don't need any of the other formats. And when it comes to the mesh, uh, exporting the vertex normals and the colors, it's also fine, which means that you can uh, leave everything as is. Another thing, if you don't want to deal with the texture as a separate file, you can also embed it. That's perfectly fine. It's up to you. And then you just hit OK. It takes a second and it's exported. And from this point on, you can import it into your software of choice. SketchUp, Revit is a little bit more fussy when it comes to these meshes or Rhino or anything else or even Blender if this is something you're into. So I hope that this was useful to you. Please go ahead and use it, make something cool out of it, you know, bring it to your projects. It's always interesting to see people uh, find something interesting, an object in, in real life and bring it in the digital world especially with the tools of today, it's super easy. And as you can see, the quality is pretty good. So I hope that this was useful and see you in the next one, guys. Bye.